Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, welcome to our webinar on the hype and realities behind CADM and NBIOT. I'm joined here today with our CTO, Brian Ray, who will be on chat and potentially chiming in from time to time. Um, I'm Glenn Schatz, I'm our VP of Business Development, and I also head up our product line uh, of cellular products. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, we've been talking about uh, cellular IoT technologies for the last couple of years, and I think we're at a point where we really are starting to see them hit the market and become reality. Um, so I decided to host this webinar really because ever since we announced the first end device certified uh, on the Verizon network about a year ago, uh, we've had hundreds of phone calls with customers and we get a lot of questions about it. And, and we're as guilty as anyone else about some of the hype. Uh, between when we first certified our device and now, there have been a lot of changes in the market, uh, more announcements, uh, technology has matured a lot. And so what I really wanna do today is focus on the state of the market today the state of devices today um, and stay away from any tremendously forward-looking uh, guesses. I don't want to talk about the billions of devices that are going to be connected to the internet. I really want to focus on what's real today. Um, due to the diverse nature of the attendees, I'm going to try to keep it at a very high level and potentially oversimplify some things. So if you're an expert and you find my explanation wanting, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to have a more detailed technical conversation with you in the future. Um, and I'll also preface this with, I'm not sharing any insider information. I've had a lot of questions about talking about uh, specific costs of specific carriers or devices. I'm, I'm gonna stay away from that and keep this at a high level. But again, uh, happy to talk to you afterwards if you reach out. So without further ado, uh, the presentation. So just some housekeeping we're going to talk about today is just an overview of CAD M1 and NB1. I'll interchangeably refer to it as LTEM and NBIOT. Um, we're going to cover the low power operations, which are the most important features of these technologies, and then go through some of the design and business considerations behind it, uh, trying to be as specific as possible, uh, thinking about the future, and then I received a lot of questions beforehand. I'll address some of those as well as take some, some live questions here. Um, just some housekeeping. If you want to submit a question, uh, you can go to our forum. You could sign up, uh, start a new topic, or uh, like I said, Brian, our CTO, is in the chat window, and uh, he'll be able to, um, to help out with, the, uh, with any live questions. Yeah, so, Glenn, I'm not seeing the, the full slideshow. Maybe you want to try to share your screen a different way. Sure. Yeah, did you share the stop sharing and then just share your desktop? Yeah, how's, uh, how's this now? I'm pretty far behind, so. I'm like 30 seconds or more behind, so go ahead and just, just go ahead and. Okay. So, um, about Link Labs. Link Labs has been a, an innovator in the low power wireless space for several years. Um, every application you see on the screen is something that we've done or helped our customers do. Everything from rhino tracking to golf cart tracking to gas and water meters, agricultural sensors. Um, alarm systems, shipping, uh, you know, you, you name it, we've, we've done something with it. Um, you know, in addition to our OEM business where we sell components, we also have a pretty robust professional services uh, division that, that helps our customers implement some of these technologies. As I'll address throughout this presentation, designing for low power is really hard. Um, and so one of the benefits of these new cellular technologies is that they are low power, but it's not as simple as slapping a module on an existing device and uh, connecting to the internet. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it than that. So um, I'll try to touch on that throughout this presentation. Just a brief overview of 
CAD M1 and uh, MB1. Uh, I'm going to keep this at a pretty high level. I'm not going to get into any 3GPP history or uh, any of the real details behind them, but just some things to note. Uh, CAD M1 has a, a simplified design, the 1.4 megahertz front end, as opposed to 20 megahertz from a traditional uh, cellular module, 4G. a traditional 4G cellular mo module. Uh, lower uh, uplink and downlink speeds. Um, one of the nice things about CADM is that they can be deployed in existing LTE bands. Um, in a lot of cases, they can be uh, upgraded with just software. Uh, CADM1 supports mobility, it supports FOTA, uh, LTE location based services, and voice over LTE. MB1, on the other hand, uh, is even uh, simpler, uh, it has a 200 kilohertz front end. So the chipsets can be a little bit less expensive, you know, 10 to 20 percent or so, less expensive than CAD M. Uh, a little bit slower, uh, and depending on if you're using a single tone versus multi tone for uplink, um, you know, it can be as slow as 20 kilobits per second. Um, the nice thing about NB1 is that it can be deployed in a lot of different ways, including in existing LTE bands, in guard bands. Uh, in refarm spectrum, some countries are putting out specific IoT bands, which uh, MB IoT can be put out in. Uh, some of the downsides is that it uh, requires new base station hardware and doesn't currently support mobility. And so, you know, we see MB1 as more designed for static assets. And the way I try to think about it is, uh, when I look at CADM, it seemed to me always like part of the 5G roadmap. Um, whereas MBIOT came out as really a competitor to some of the other low power wide area networks that are out there like LoRa and Sigfox. Um, and so, um, you know, there's, there's some reasons you, you might use one or the other. We are focusing on CAD M1 initially because that's what's being rolled out in the United States. Um, we think that it powers a more diverse set of applications as well. Um, so that's what we're focused on. Uh, one thing to note about both technologies is that you'll get better coverage, uh, all other things being equal, than existing LTE networks by about 10 to 20 dB, um, which, you know, for, in practical sense, will get you a little bit deeper building penetration. Um, so maybe one wall deeper, even two potentially. Um, battery performance, which I'll go into uh, later on, is going to be application specific. Um, one thing to note is that MB1 has a lower peak current, so you might have some more flexibility in battery selection, but um, in, in general, battery selection is going to be very, very application specific. Uh, I'm going to spend some time focusing on the different parts of a cellular IoT system, and this applies to, to all cellular IoT systems and not just uh, CAD-M and uh, MB-IoT. Um, there's a lot of confusion over, you know, when you use the word module, uh, what that means, uh, how, how the different platforms fit in. Um, and so just going from left to right on the screen, uh, a typical cellular IoT system will have uh, the application, so which is a sensor or actuator or some other type of uh, I.O., uh, a host application processor that controls that application, um, as well as does some, uh, you know, Local logic, if that uh, is required, handles the interface with the uh, the uh, modem. Um, you know, there's a battery involved there. There's some power management and memory. Um, then there's a, uh, a cellular uh, module, typically, and that involves a, uh, an RF front end, a baseband chipset, some power management, and some memory. Uh, a SIM is involved somewhere in the process. Uh, it could either be on the application board or the or the module board, depending on how your system is set up. Uh, it will communicate to a network. That network will then uh, send it uh, into the, the cellular network's uh, internal systems. The data will be then passed somehow to the uh, to the end user. So just to break down each component again to to avoid confusion. Um, there are uh, four providers uh, right now of, of CADM baseband chipsets. Sequans, who we use, uh, Altair, Qualcomm, uh, and Intel all provide baseband chipsets. This is the lowest level piece of the stack when it comes to cellular IoT. Um, 
the chipset itself uh, is typically uh, pretty challenging to implement um, unless you're producing millions of devices or your uh, module manufacturer, you, you typically wouldn't use the chipset uh, on its own. The next level up, which is what most of us talk about when we talk about a uh, cellular module, uh, includes the baseband chipset, some sort of RF front end, uh, potentially some power management as well as some memory. I have a bunch of different vendors uh, here. Uh, these are you know, all the vendors that currently have CADM uh, or MBIOT products announced. Um, so, you know, Sequans, again, makes their own module, uh, Jamalto, Ublox, Quectel, Sierra, Telet, Fibocom, Huawei, WNC, and Simcom. I didn't want to leave anyone out, but... Um, so these modules are typically uh, FCC certified or reg have regulatory certifications, um, but they're not something that you can just go and put on the network. So they all have to be certified by the carrier, um, but that carrier certification isn't enough to go and put the, the modules on the network, and I'll get into that a little bit uh, later. The next uh, type of device in the system was what I would call a hardware platform. Different companies call this different things. They call them systems, platforms, modems. Uh, you know, this is where Link Labs plays. Uh, the the red lines, you know, enc encompass a lot of the different things that vendors in, uh, incorporate in their hardware platform. It may include uh, simplified hardware interfaces like pin interfaces um, that are standard across a product family, uh, proprietary software stacks that do different things. Uh, the SIM holder um, or the eSIM might be in this platform. There might be some power management. It might tie into a cloud platform. Uh, there might be some sort of pre-certification on various carriers. Um, and so when you hear of a hardware platform or a, a socket modem or some sort of system on a module, uh, this is what vendors are typically talking about. Um, and it's best to understand how this plays with your application, how, what the development looks like, and how you might use it, uh, rather than trying to um, you know, just look for different features. Because in the end, they're all just different ways of incorporating the same uh, types of cellular modules that are out there. So brief uh, slide on network availability. Um, you know, I, I put this slide up there. It's it's hard to see, and that's on purpose. Um, you know, this is from several different vendors. Their different uh, outlook on what the market is in terms of uh, what networks have which types of coverage, uh, whether it's CADM or MBIOT. Uh, what I, what I'm trying to put forward in this slide is to trust what you can test. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of hype in this market still around uh, network announcements and announcements of certain devices in certain areas. Um, what I can tell everyone that's listening today is that uh, Verizon has a CADM network. We use it. Uh, it works. It has all the features that you need for a CADM network. Um, AT&T has a CADM network. We don't currently use it, but we have trusted partners that uh, are using it, and we we will be using that network as well uh, soon. Uh, outside of that, I have a lot of uh, discussions with carriers. Uh, different carriers have rolled out test networks. Uh, I'm not going to get into the different carriers here. I would suggest that you make sure you engage with your local carrier uh, beyond just the marketing folks and talk to the device technologies people, um, uh, some of the more technical people about when network availability is, is going to be uh, where you need it to be for deployment. Uh, and then also make sure you're talking to the uh, to the hardware vendors because the hardware vendors are often network specific. And so, um, you know, for example, you might have a module vendor that can support lots of different bands, but they may have only certified on uh, a couple carriers. So, um, you know, again, in order to get behind, uh, away from the hype and into what you can actually deploy, you just need to ask the questions of the people that are selling you either service or hardware. And I'm happy to, to talk specifics with anyone if, if you have specific questions about specific carriers. Um, you know, if, if you reach out uh, directly, I can, I can talk to you about that. So 
Yeah, this is the part of the presentation where I'm going to focus a lot of time on the different low power uh, modes and how low power operations uh, work. Um, the two main low power modes or the two uh, that, that CADM and MBIOT support are uh, PSM or power savings mode as well as uh, EDRX, extended discontinuous receive mode. Uh, they're different types of power savings uh, modes that have different use cases. Um, PSM is designed primarily for event or timer driven uplink um, or or a high latency downlink like a mailbox check. Um, if a device moves uh, during the sleep period, um, you might have some uh, um, you know, power degradation on wake up as it's uh, you know, updating its tracking area, as it's looking for towers. Um, you'll still have some power savings over just turning the device on and off. Um, but you know, what I would say here is make sure you're uh, piloting before you're taking uh, any, um, any risk over fully deploying a battery powered system because your performance in the field is gonna have uh, a lot of variability. It's gonna depend on you know, signal coverage and how often your device moves um, and, and lots of other things and, and how your battery performs in the real world versus in the lab or on a spreadsheet. EDRX is a, a little bit different than PSM. Uh, it basically is a replacement for an always-on device that can afford a little bit more latency. Uh, a typical LTE paging cycle is 1.28 seconds, um, and the device can be reached by the network if traffic is queued for it during that cycle. Um, DRX uh, extended that paging cycle to up to 10.24 seconds. Um, but that, that window is still not going to give you enough uh, battery savings for multi-year types of applications. Um, and with EDRX, uh, CAT M1 and NB1 extended the normal idle uh, window to 5.12 seconds uh, for CAT M and 20.48 seconds for NB. Um, and it basically tells the network how many hyperframes it can sleep before it's checking back in for traffic. And one of the nice things about EDRX is that you can adjust the paging cycles up to a maximum of 44 minutes, roughly, for uh, CAT M and three hours for MBIOT. So it's basically like a um, you know, always on device that is only going to be able to receive data at certain intervals. Um, so we like EDRX for devices that are always on. Um, that don't necessarily require super, super low latency downlink um, or queuing from the network. So uh, there are different reasons you would use both. Uh, either one, you can use both. Um, you know, the more you mess with power, the more complicated your design gets. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're thinking about it. Uh, at Link Labs, we've tried to make this easy for customers and, uh, you know, basically, by helping them choose which power modes are best for their applications, and I'll discuss that again a little bit later on in this presentation. So uh, rather than talk through um, specifics about, you know, the battery sleep currents and peak currents and the different cycles, I, I decided to talk through some example applications. And these are applications that we've actually tested our estimated battery lives are based on, on real performance in the field uh, in different modes. Um, and so, you know, the I decided to start with the most complicated application or one of the more complicated applications out there, a GPS tracker. Um, you know, with GPS trackers, the GPS fix itself matters a lot. Um, so deciding you know, what your fix interval is uh, goes a long way in understanding your battery life. Um, you know, the more logic that can be built in using accelerometers or other types of technology to uh, extend battery life are really important for a GPS application. So for the, uh, for the application I've listed here, um, I put consumer GPS tracker, so it has a relatively small battery. Uh, the device you see on the right is a reference design that we have. Uh, it's about the size of a credit card um, and about half an inch thick. Um, you know, you can see the battery life varies significantly based on uh, the the fixed and transmission interval, um, and the different power modes actually don't make a ton of difference um, from a 
you know, from a, a battery life standpoint, it carves off some uh, some days. And so, but you can see with a tracker like this, um, you can get several months checking in, you know, once a day or a couple times a day. Um, you know, if you're using this device for something that needs to check in more regularly, um, you know, you probably want to charge it daily. Um, but which, that's still pretty good performance for a device this small uh, with this small of a battery. The um, the last uh, uh, two I left in there just as a comparison. Uh, if you use PSM mode versus just toggling the device on and off. So what that would show is an improvement over a you know, traditional cellular device that um, you, know, you could still do some of these low power operations with, um, but you couldn't get quite as low uh, as you would if you implemented PSM. I see Brian smiling over here, so you guys must all be asking him some interesting questions. Not really. No. We're joking about Takashi enclosures. Oh, we do like Takashi enclosures. <laughs> Um, so another example application uh, would be uh, environmental sensor with some sort of alarm condition. Um, you know, this has a much, much longer battery life uh, because it doesn't have the GPS fix. Uh, and so you can see you can get nearly uh, a year of battery life or, you know, 10 months of battery life checking in once a day in PSM mode. And again, this is a relatively small battery. It's a 450 milliamp hour battery. Um, you know, compare that with your cell phone, which are typically 2,500 milliamp hours or more. Um, so, you know, battery selection is important for your application. Um, you know, you can potentially use for something like this uh, you know, three AA batteries. Um, you know, there's there's lots of different op options for batteries, but um, this is just kind of an example of different types of, uh, of battery lives under different use cases. Uh, another thing to note as you're thinking about battery is that cell modems require uh, much higher sustained peak currents uh, than, say, like a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth tracker. So it can be up to 400 uh, milliamps for, you know, seconds, uh, in, in, the, in the dozens of seconds at some time. So only certain chemistries will work. Um, and so that's going to potentially increase the cost of your device because you're going to have to use a more expensive battery. So you know, the idea of using a coin cell or something with a cell device is not really an option for you. Um, so we, we had a lot of questions come in before the webinar about, about batteries. Um, batteries are a very complicated conversation, perfectly frank, and one that we'll typically work with customers on on a professional services basis. Typically, battery selection is part of our scoping phase. Um, so feel free to reach out, and I can get you in touch with the right folks at Link Labs that, can, uh, that are battery experts and can help you with with that problem. And then the last application, you know, we, we hear a lot of talk about these 10 year plus batteries uh, powered applications like gas and water meters. And really what I'm showing you here is that that's a real, um, you know, that's, that's a real claim uh, with a 7.7 .7 amp hour C cell battery, uh, which you, know, you can get out there virtually relatively easily. You can get you know, over 10 years checking in a few times a day with a gas meter. Um, one of the nice things about water and gas meters is they're static. So once you've done your initial testing, you don't really have to worry too much about the cell network performing uh, differently um, in the real world as you might with a mobile asset. Um, and, you know, this is just to show you that uh, you can almost double battery life using PSM mode versus maybe using a 2G modem and just turning it on and off. So, uh, you know, I, I, I see a lot of these applications over time incorporating uh, CAD-M or MBIOT uh, because it's just a, a no-brainer. So, uh, I mentioned some of this earlier, but, you know, chemistry is really important. Uh, only certain types of batteries will work. They tend to be uh, more expensive and a little bit more boutique batteries, so make sure you're thinking about that early on. Uh, batteries are typically a very expensive on a percentage basis cost of your bomb, and so as you're talking to vendors about um, the various costs, um, you know make sure you're focusing on 
on battery and uh, you know, being able to, to right size your battery is really important. Um, and so we see a lot of people, you know, we have this reference GPS design and we see a lot of people ask us, well, can you just get us an off the shelf version of it? Um, but the first question I ask is, well, what's your application? How long does it need to last? Um, and then we start thinking about battery and, you know, if you're doing 10,000 devices or 5,000 devices, uh, shifting from a one amp hour battery to a 450 milliamp hour battery might save you a few dollars um, on bomb cost, which um, you know would, would make it worthwhile in doing a, a specific design for your application. Uh, same thing goes for enclosures as well, but uh, batteries especially. And then the, the final consideration that I would say is make sure you're testing your device in the real world. You're getting real data. Um, you know you're. Uh, testing in different types of environments, different locations, because um, your battery is going to perform on a on a real cell network a little bit differently uh, than it does in a in, you know in the lab or in your office. So make sure you're testing. Brian, do we have any emergent questions on the first half? No, I'm slaying them as they come up. Okay, awesome. That's why it's good to have your the CTO as your sidekick. You can typically uh, take on take on all comers. So the next next part, you know, I had a lot of questions around cost, and, and as I mentioned, I'm going to stay away from specifics uh, on cost. Uh, a lot of this is going to be, you know, based on who you are as a buyer. You know, if you're Coca-Cola, chances are you're going to be getting a better price than Joe Startup down the street trying to do a dog tracker. Um, so uh, I will talk some specifics um, in specific ranges just to give everyone a sense of orders of magnitude. But when it comes to specific components, really, you know, go through your distributors, go directly to the vendors. Um, one thing that people also uh, sometimes don't consider when they're talking about the cost of a device is the design considerations. So, um, you know, the more integrated the uh, the device, the cheaper the, the component cost will be, but also the more complicated the design will be. So, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, why can't I just implement the Qualcomm or Sequence chip, uh, you know, the baseband chip, and, you know, I got a bunch of smart people in my company, we can, uh, we can build out the, the, the rest of it. And, you know, my, my response to that is, sure, you can, you know, maybe get that baseband chip for $5, but you're going to be putting, you know, in the seven figures uh, into both the design and development, as well as the certification once you start doing that. So, uh, you know, to keep that in mind, it's not all about the chipset cost or the component cost. It's, it's really about the total cost of ownership, uh, as well as the complexity of managing it uh, throughout. And then, you know, certification and testing is an important consideration. Uh, it's usually more predictable, but it's, it's worth noting. Uh, a lot of questions around how much these uh, IoT plans cost. I'll, I'll address that a little bit. And then there's another, I wouldn't say it's a hidden cost, but it's a cost that people don't think about. It's how do you manage tens of thousands of devices as a company? If, if your company's uh, business model is to sell gas meters or to um, you know, build uh, smoke alarms, are you really in the business of managing tens of thousands of devices over, uh, you know, the nation or the world? And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through. So, again, these are just uh, you know ranges. Uh, really, you want to consult with your distributor uh, or your or your vendors directly. Uh, for these ranges, I, I'm assuming about ten thousand units a year. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, the uh, the block on the left is the, the host application. So you know, typically the, the host application, PCB, your memory, your microcontroller, uh, connectors, uh, other components are going to cost you somewhere between 10 and $30, and that's uh, delivered. So that includes assembly, testing through your CM. Uh, again, this is just a range. It can be much more than this. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to get it much less than this at that volume, but uh, it can definitely be more. Um, and then there's the cellular module piece of it. Um, and so there's the, the actual module. So all the vendors I had above, you know, we've seen uh, publicly advertised ranges everywhere from seven to $20 at these volumes. Um, so, you know, if you're using 10 to $15 as an estimate of the module itself, that's probably a good place to be. Um, but then there's also the SIM, which is a couple bucks. And there's a SIM holder, which is, you know, 50 cents to a dollar, and then there are level shifters and connectors. And by the time 
where I left off was talking about antennas. Um, don't underestimate antennas. They're expensive uh, in terms of the percentage cost of your device. There are inexpensive antennas out there, but antennas are definitely one of those things where you get what you pay for. Um, and then batteries we've addressed, and the enclosure is also something not to not to forget. Um, you know, a lot of companies, if if you have uh, internal industrial design teams, you know that that's not as much of a concern for you, and you're already very experienced it, with it. But if you're a startup and you're looking at this, don't don't forget to consider uh, off the shelf enclosures. I think someone made a joke about the Takashi enclosure earlier, but we like using off the shelf enclosures where possible. Uh, another cost that is important to remember are uh, certification and testing. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around what certification is required where. Uh, so I'm going to try to alleviate some of that confusion here. But what I would recommend is that uh, you talk to uh, both the carriers that you're working with as well as uh, design houses to get a lot more, or sorry, test houses to get more detail on certification testing costs. Um, you know, this is one of those things that when when we first started working with cellular IoT was a little bit confusing. So I'm going to try to summarize it here. Uh, but again, make sure you're talk, talking to the carriers, talking to a test house. Um, so PTCRB uh, testing is required by some carriers. It's a uh, um, it's a it's a it's a way for the carriers to kind of push off testing to an accredited uh, testing organization. Um, PTCRB tests can uh, can range in, in cost, but you're typically t looking at um, you know somewhere in the low five figures for the actual test and then an additional uh, few thousand dollars to register the device with PTCRB. Um, in the US, AT&T uh, requires PTCRB. Um, other carriers like Verizon require carrier-specific certifications, um, and typically those tests, uh, you know, can range in the thousands of dollars to to more. Um, I, all the carriers are trying to make this a little bit easier um, and it more inexpensive because they realize with IoT devices, it's not like uh, putting a handset on the network. But uh, don't underestimate the time and money that it costs to to undertake these tests. Um, outside of North America. Uh, the GCF or the Global Certification Forum takes the place of PTCRB, um, and the, the requirements are pretty similar. Uh, the requirements for having a GCF certified device, again, vary from carrier to carrier, so uh, make sure you're talking to your carrier and communicating with them about what their requirements are. Um, GCF has an annual membership fee, and the, you know, so I think it's around 5,000 euro. Um, um, so just keep that in mind as well if you're certifying your device. And then there are, of course, the regulatory certifications, which, uh, again, the testing typically costs in the, the low five figures of ten to you know, $30,000 or so. Um, you know, if you were using the, the baseband chipset itself and building from the ground up, you're probably looking closer to a half a million dollars worth of certification to get that uh, to combine with you know, the regulatory certifications as well as the different carrier certifications. So just keep that in mind if you have aspirations of building from the baseband chip set up. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of risk mitigation by using something that's pre-certified. And so the module vendors that, that I listed above will typically all certify their devices with carriers. And then a lot of the hardware platforms like Link Labs will do pre-certification of a, of a hardware platform that either uh, precludes the need to do additional carrier certification uh, or takes a lot of the risk out of it because you're essentially using a device that already is certified um, by a carrier. Put that hide so you can see that. Hmm? You can see that hide. Uh, Stop sharing. Things. Got it. So uh, the next big thing that we're going to talk about are costs of data. And one of the things that I always have to reiterate with um, uh, with customers and talking about cost is that these uh, IoT plans are typically very inexpensive on a per device basis. So you're talking, you know, one to two dollars a month. You know, in, in higher volumes, maybe five dollars a month, and in lower volumes. But what you're getting for that data for that that dollar is actually much lower. So if you have a traditional cell, cellular plan, you may pay ten dollars for a gigabyte of data a month. So that works out to about a dollar per hundred megabytes. With a 
uh, CAT M plan or an MBIOT plan, you're looking at you know a dollar per megabyte, uh, and so you know it could be a hundred times more expensive per byte. So you know, efficiently transmitting that data is really really important. Um, and a lot of the time you're not actually paying for the data you transmit. So even if you're sending 20 bytes of data for your application, uh, you're paying for the overhead. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not, not talking about control plane overhead that keeps the cellular network and signaling uh, alive, but what I'm talking about is just the protocol overhead. So if you implement uh, you know, MQTT, which is a very efficient uh, way of transmitting data, you're still looking at 500 bytes or so of overhead uh, per transmission. If you do HTTPS, you're looking at uh, you know kilobytes of data of overhead. Um, if you want to send secure uh, data securely, so um, just keep that in mind. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Link Labs' approach here in a bit, um, but you know the data can can be expensive if you're not managing it correctly with these plans. And finally, there's the, the managed service bit. Uh, a lot of carriers have platforms that cover some of this. Um, a lot of vendors uh, like, uh, like Link Labs and others have pieces of this that they manage. But uh, each of the different blocks that I have on this slide are all really important to consider uh, about uh, you know, when you're building your device over the lifetime of the device. So things like uh, you know, SIM management and device management, uh, typically you can do directly with a carrier, but um, it does require work, uh, especially if you're managing tens of thousands of devices. Managing uh, firmware over the air is also very important. Uh, typically, if your device is in the field for years, you're going to have to push firmware updates to it. There are various ways to do it, um, you know, it's, but it's not as simple as uh, getting a device that's, uh, you know, where the, the module itself is lightweight M2M approved. Uh, and then just doing lightweight M to M. Typically, on the application side, you're going to have to implement your own firmware. So, uh, over the air. So, just keep that in mind as you're as you're developing your devices for the future. Um, you know, that's a big part of it, uh, and that can cost you know money as well for the data that you're you're using, or uh, if you're using um, you know a, a client for for FOTA, they may charge on a monthly basis or on a per instance basis. So, just keep that in mind as you're thinking about costs. Uh, and then just more broadly, some other risks and challenges. This is a, a, a relatively new market. Even though you've been hearing press releases and announcements about this stuff for the last couple of years, I mean, components uh, are just now starting to come on the market in any production quantities. And so as you're working with vendors, make sure you understand uh, their timelines and availabilities. Um, make sure you look at that uh, with a skeptical eye and, and be conservative. And you know, I would say that any engagement with us, uh, be as skeptical about timelines as anyone else. It's, it's software, it, it, it's hard, um, things slip. So, um, you know, on the bright side, a lot of the stuff uh, that we've been talking about for the last year is available now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's worth talking to your, your vendors about. Uh, same thing with network availability. Um, there's a difference between testing a device on a network and having the network be able to support. Uh, you know, your application across your customer base everywhere. Um, you know, typically, the networks are going to be tested in a couple key markets and then rolled out uh, across the nation um, or the coverage of that carrier. So uh, make sure you're, you're asking your carrier the right questions that you're testing your devices on the network. Um, you know, the, the, we're all used to being able to have a single SIM and device that roams globally. We're not quite there yet with... Uh, with this technology. Um, it has nothing to do with any technical limitations, but it's, it's more to do with uh, inter-carrier agreements and which markets are actually going to have these networks deployed. Uh, and then because typically these devices are more streamlined, the devices may only support one or two bands. Um, and so even uh, you know, if carriers have agreements and you have roaming agreements, your device may not support all the bands that are necessary for global roaming. So um, you know, we look at this as a as a market by market uh, and carrier by carrier approach at this moment. Um, maybe 18 to 24 months from now, we can start talking about true global coverage and uh, you know multiple uh, multiple carriers, multiple band support, more complex devices. Just keep in mind, though, you're also paying for that complexity. So if you're going to be supporting multiple bands um, and multiple SIMs, that's that's going to be a, a more expensive device. Um, 
I've already touched on data usage and, and exposure. Uh, as you're thinking through plans, there are different types of uh, IoT plans out there. Some of them are um, you know, prepaid. Some of them are month by month. Um, you know, as, you, as you think about which plans are, are useful to you, make sure you really understand your application's data usage. Uh, it's really important. Uh, and same thing with, uh, with power. Uh, as I mentioned before, you really need to test your application in the field. Um, and, uh, and battery performance can vary based on application-specific, network-specific requirements that aren't always uh, clear at the bench or in the lab. So uh, I'm going to talk through in this last bit about Link Labs' approach to helping our customers get their cellular IoT devices on the air. Um, what I will say going into this is that uh, this is a, an approach that we've built based on a lot of our experience implementing low power devices uh, in the unlicensed band for customers and some of the challenges that they've had uh, implementing our hardware. Um, this isn't uh, the right approach for everyone. If you have a lot of experience implementing uh, cellular devices, um, you may not need some of the pieces that we offer. But what I can say is that we've tried to make it as easy as possible to take advantage of the LTEM and NBIOT specific features such as uh, low power, as well as uh, optimize the data plans to minimize any uh, sticker shock on your cell bills. Um, and we think it's a good approach for, for a lot of the customers that we work with. Um, so I'm going to go through the different pieces of it um, and, and how we think about uh, building an IoT device. So um, we have a simplified hardware and software interface. And what I mean by this is that our module is highly optimized for extremely low power operation. Um, and to do that, we have, uh, we've abstracted uh, some of the different types of uh, interfaces that a module vendor might give you. So a typical interface with a module is via AT commands. And what we've done is we've bundled a lot of the different uh, options that you might have to implement using AT commands and really and just given you a, a UART API. And you know, firmware is never simple, but this is about as simple as it gets. You, know, you send a, a wake signal to our module and you send a data. It responds with acknowledgment and you can be confident that your uh, data has gotten at least to the network. Um, you know, we have different power modes and power settings that you can also control via this UART API. So rather than having to implement uh, PSM mode on your own, uh, we've done that for you. Uh, where possible, we've pre-certified our module with carriers. Um, so in some cases, you can use this module and connect directly to the network. Um, we have included uh, approved CAD-M SIM cards. Um, we've pre-negotiated pricing plans. Um, so a lot of this is, uh, is really to make getting on the network a lot easier for customers. Um, and then one of the things that we've also tried to do is um, we've made it easier to send data efficiently. And so you don't really have to make a lot of choices around which protocol you're going to use and you know, the different module vendors offer different types of IP stacks that you can use, but all of those um, typically have a, a decent amount of overhead. We've tried to, to remove some of that for you. And just to talk a little bit about our uh, efficient communications layer. So there are lots of trade-offs when making decisions around which protocols to use. Um, one of the things that's really important to our customers and to Link Labs is that the communications be secure. And so, you know, simply saying we're going to send raw data in a very efficient way wasn't enough for us. And so what Link Labs has done is worked with carriers to essentially uh, develop a private internet connection to your device for you. And, and the reason we've done that is because that way you don't have to implement any high overhead uh, SSL or other types of encryption on the end node because your data is never touching the public internet. And again, this isn't for everyone, uh, but we think that this is a really good implementation for a lot of our customers um, who are also very cost conscious when it comes to the amount of data being used. Uh, just a, a brief example, a typical Link Labs message uh, using our uh, data efficient 
communications layer is going to be transmitting 100 to 200 bytes for um, a 20 byte payload. Whereas if you were to do that same thing using HTTPS, you would be looking at you know, upwards of five kilobytes for that same message, uh, doing all of the uh, certificate exchanges as well as just the, the overhead of the, the message itself. Um, and again, security is really, really important to us. And so uh, we've done everything we can to keep this data secure and from touching the public internet at all. So it basically goes directly from your device uh, to your back end without any, uh, you know, any exposure to, to potential th threat vectors. And then uh, on the back end side, we've tried to simplify device management. Um, like I said, a, a lot of operator, cellular operators have um, device management portals and platforms. Uh, they are various degrees of user friendliness. Um, what we've done is we, we have one single managed service platform that allows you to connect to any uh, cell network that we support with our hardware um, with a standard set of open APIs that allow you to uh, manage your devices. Um, the other types of modules that we have in this uh, that are available are things like rules and alerts for devices, uh, warnings around data, um, power and data management, uh, reporting, which will help you with billing, uh, as well as a, uh, a module that allows you to manage uh, over-the-air firmware updates for your devices. And so you know, if you're developing a, an application, you have access to this REST API, um, and it allows you the flexibility of having to develop once and then be able to translate that development to whichever type of uh, cell service or, uh, or device that you would like to use that we support. So you can develop a CAD-M device for Verizon now um, and uh, develop your application on that, and it will work the same way with a MBIOT device for Orange in the future. Maybe that was a bad example. An MBIOT device for Vodafone in the future. Okay. Sorry. And the reason I say that is because Orange is going to support CAD-M uh, primarily first. And then, uh, you know, b right before I open it up for additional questions and address some of the questions we got uh, before, I wanted to share one example that we've developed in-house using CAD-M, um, as well as uh, some of the, the battery characteristics of that specific example. So we have a technology that we call AirFinder, which is a... Um, real-time location system using uh, BLE. Um, and uh, so in this particular example, we have a, a mobile access point. So it's a mobile Bluetooth access point um, that's gathering location data from Bluetooth tags. Um, and this access point is, uh, you see here on a truck, but it's designed to be able to migrate from inside of a building to a loading dock to a truck and, uh, and, and all be battery powered, which um, you know, typically isn't possible with this type of technology uh, before CAD-M. And so you know, just the, this is just the architecture of that system. The tags are communicating location and other sensor data to uh, that access point. The access point is communicating to a cell network, uh, which is then going through conductor, and then we eat our own uh, dog food, and we, we use the conductor API um, for, uh, for the AirFinder application. And you know, as you can see, with the with the battery calculations, our mobile airfinder access point, um, even with a relatively uh, frequent transmission interval, so you know, once every five minutes, which is typically more than we would expect for an asset that um, you know is in the back of a truck, because the way that airfinder works is it only transmits when a device moves. Um, you're getting a couple months of battery life, and so um, you know if you change that transmission interval to once an hour, you're getting several months of battery life in PSM mode. Um, you know, these longer use cases would be more for something that's primarily static, like um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, containers or something uh, in, a, in a lay down yard. But you, know, you can see we can get multiple years of battery life with uh, a mobile AirFinder access point. And that's of the access point itself. Um, and so compare that to what we'd had to do before, which is basically an always on access point, would only last 12 hours or so on a battery. So we, you know, we have a battery backup in those cases, but really you would never want to use an always on access point um, uh, for a mobile device like this. 
So just, uh, you know, I touched on some of this earlier during the, the intermission period. <laughs> um, but uh, so what's next? Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about the sunset of 2G technologies. Uh, Verizon has announced the sunset of uh, both 2G, 3G CDMA um, in 2019. And so uh, LTEM and, and MBIOT have come around at a perfect time to, for those sunsets. I mean, two years sounds like a long time, but it, it's not. Um, and so what I would suggest is if you have CDMA devices now, you start talking to your uh, your vendors talk to us about how to transition you from from your CDMA devices to um, uh, To CAD M devices and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at some of the costs associated with that um, As well as the, the data plans, you know, I think it uh, We'll put it this way. But I think the cost that you'll save transitioning to CAD M uh, will Compensate you for some of the pain of the development costs to make that transition um, you know, 3G sunset is a little bit more uh, up in the air. I think globally, it's still a long way away. Um, a lot of uh, you know, global carriers still rely on HSPA Plus and, um, and UMTS um, for a lot of their uh, communications, and so I'm not I'm hesitant to put a, a, a timeline on on a 3G sunset. Probably, um, you know, early to mid 2020s is what you'd be looking at, but um, you definitely consult your carrier specifically. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the, the 5G horizon looming. And uh, I actually think this is kind of funny because you, know, you see tons and tons of press releases about 5G, um, but there's still not an official definition behind it. And so all these press releases are different chipset makers or base station providers really jockeying to to define what 5G is for themselves and to suit their needs. Um, you know, so, you know, when, when you hear about 5G, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, typically, when people are talking about 5G, they're talking about gigabit LTE. So uh, that's like a convergence of fiber and, and, and wireless um, serving uh, gigabit ethernet. Um, you know, they're talking about lower latency. Um, you, typically, it's gonna be in the higher frequency bands. Um, so the ranges are going to be shorter. You're going to have more distributed cells. Um, you know, the, definitely ha uh, 5G will have enhanced spectral efficiency. Uh, signaling will, will more, more than likely be uh, be more efficient. Um, and then also the uh, the concept of dynamic dynamic spectrum access is probably going to be part of the 5G uh, consideration. But but again, it's all yet to be defined. And so anyone that's putting dates on when 5G is going to be available. Um, you know, I would question that. And, and the other thing to remember is that 5G actually isn't anything right now other than uh, kind of the next phase of LTE. So it's not like the transition from, uh, you know, uh, HSPA to LTE, which is a different technology. Uh, 5G will be based on LTE or LTE advanced. And so if you're implementing a, uh, an LTEM uh, device now, you know, you, I don't think you have to worry at all about uh, 5G, I think it's will just be subsumed into it. Um, one of the tenets behind 5G that some people have talked about is the the concept of being able to um, communicate with several hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connections for wireless sensors, um, you know, on, on each base station. So um, the uh, you know the idea of of worrying about 5G as you're building a CAD M device, I think, is uh, a little nonsensical. So um, you know. What about 5G? If you're thinking about a, an IoT device, uh, don't worry about it. It will do nothing but improve what you already have. We're way over time, so we're gonna wrap up. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, I was gonna try to get to some questions, but, uh, but I think since we're over time, I'll save the questions for direct responses. I think Brian's probably uh, uh, managed to answer a lot of them in real time. Um, if you're interested in uh, in learning more, or uh, or buying a dev kit, which are available now, um, while supplies last, uh, I'll, I'll put it that way. They are actually selling really quickly, and we're already having to um, to, to do another spin uh, of a production uh, dev kits. Um, you can get them directly from us at our at our store. You can get them at DigiKey, um, and we're also distributed by Feature and Arrow, uh, who don't have dev kits in stock right now. Um, but if you happen to work for Future and Arrow, you can uh, you can start bugging your 
your uh, product marketing managers to get some of those in stock for you guys to it's, it's, to get out to your uh, to, to your customers. So. Thank you all for the time. Apologies for the technical difficulties earlier. Uh, we'll do our best to, to merge these two and get out uh, a single webinar that you guys can, can view and pass around to all your friends. Uh, thank you.